Shalom brothers and sisters and welcome to our Sabbath sacrament service uh, on the 5th, sorry the 6th of the 1st 2024, I got lost on my days Thanks. then, so we're going to ask Kyle to invite God's Spirit to be with us this morning. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. I would like to invite our Lord and Saviour to be with us all this morning, that he may be with us, that he may grant us his peace and his happiness. And I say this in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brother Carl, for that. So well, hopefully you've got, like we have, your emblems ready and are ready as we say the prayers. So we do this in remembrance of the gift to us, Christ Jesus. And this helps us to, to remind us of our covenant to God, that we will always pray and always follow him. So I'm going to ask Brother Kyle to read uh, the first prayer for the bread which comes from the book of Moroni and it's chapter 3 and verse 2 uh, verse 3 sorry Over to you. at this time we welcome all present to Christ's table we invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ in whose name we worship the Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to His mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ, as individuals and as a community, worshiping Jesus Christ through God's Word, the sacraments, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. If you'd like to bow your heads, or kneel and pray. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee, in the name of Thy Son Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he hath given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. Now we come to the wine, which is in the book of Moroni, chapter 5, and the prayer starts in verse 2. So if you kneel or bow, whatever you can do, as I commence with the prayer. O God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee, in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do it in remembrance of the blood of Thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his spirit to be with them. Amen. Amen. So let us contemplate on the emblems we have just taken. There's a time. To think of the blood of Christ and what he did for us. He, he died and took us all our sins. I had a dream that I gave a talk in sacrament meeting. The talk was on overcoming obstacles. 
but in my dream there was one obstacle after another. I wanted to give up because it was too hard and wasn't working out. I couldn't get to the pulpit. Kids were crying. People were shuffling around. Nobody was listening, and someone else started giving their talk before I could even finish the first sentence. Everyone was unable to hear or see me. But it felt like I needed to keep going, because I was trying to give a talk that was about overcoming obstacles. I woke up at that point, wishing I could have seen what the rest of my talk said. So I started looking up articles about overcoming obstacles, and I found one article that said three tools are needed to overcome obstacles. One is resilience. That makes sense. We need to toughen up and not let little things destroy us. The next tool is perseverance. That also makes sense. We need to keep going, even when things seem hard. The third tool is what really struck me. It is compassion. I started reflecting on why or how compassion would be a tool to remove obstacles. I looked up the meaning of the word. Compassion is a deep understanding of another, so deep that it's like we can walk in their shoes. It brings us to a place where we understand so deeply that when the other person hurts, we hurt. When they feel joy, we feel joy. It unites us as one body. We need compassion for others, for ourselves, and from others to really remove all the obstacles in life and inside ourselves. I remembered a day in my life where compassion removed a huge obstacle and changed the entire trajectory of life for my family. My husband has refractory temporal lobe epilepsy, which means he has seizures that start in his temporal lobe and generalize, and it's a permanent condition. About nine years ago, he lost control of his seizures. We tried various neurologists, about 20 different medications, and every alternative treatment we could find or that anyone suggested. The seizures kept getting worse. We met one cruel doctor after another who blamed him for his seizures, completely lacking any understanding and not listening to us. One day, my husband went into status epilepticus, which is when there is seizure after seizure after seizure with no time in between to recover. It is deadly. We had so many abusive doctors and bad experience in the hospital already, there's nothing else that was serious enough to have me calling 911. But I saw the life leaving his eyes, and the seizures were lasting so long, and they were so close together, that he wasn't getting enough oxygen. He was dying. So I called my EMS friend for help. I left her a crazy, stressful voice message. Andrew isn't breathing and he's blue. I need help. She was so compassionate. She called 911 for me and led the ambulance through our unmarked roads to our hard-to-find house. EMS came, and more compassionate friends and strangers carried my over 200-pound husband down our wooden ladder staircase as he was seizing and vomiting on them. I called another compassionate friend who met me on the highway midway as I followed the ambulance to the hospital. She took my kids and stuck $100 cash in my pocket, knowing I wouldn't have had any time to prepare. Two more compassionate friends went to my house while we were at the hospital and washed our sheets and cleaned up all the body fluids because they didn't want it to be even worse when we got home. We didn't have plumbing at the time, so that really meant a lot to me. When we got to the hospital, they were able to give my husband enough drugs to almost put him in a coma and stop the seizures. I lucked out and got an old friend as our ER doctor, who was also compassionate. Instead of sending my husband to the neurology unit to be cared for by a previously abusive doctor, he sent my husband to the ICU, where a traveling doctor would care for him. Before the doctor started his shift, two men I didn't know who were full of compassion came to the ICU room to give my husband and family a blessing. My parents had called them asking for help. It was the bishop and first counselor of our ward that we hadn't been active in. These guys didn't know us at all, but their hearts were full for our suffering, and I know their presence and blessing made a difference. Then the traveling doctor arrived. This doctor was so compassionate, he deeply understood. He said, I know what it's like. My mother had epilepsy, and I remember being four years old and hearing her body drop. I started to cry and replied, We have a four-year-old son. And he was so full of compassion, he actually cried with me in the ICU room over my husband's unconscious body. The nurse helped me prepare myself to the possibility that my husband wouldn't wake up right, but thankfully and miraculously he did. The traveling doctor then worked the next two days to gather all my husband's medical records and get him into an excellent epilepsy center in Seattle. This day of compassion 
People working together as the body of Christ for us changed the future for our family. It took four years of working with this specialized and caring team, but we were finally able to achieve the impossible and stop the seizures. With divine provision, my family has enjoyed the past three years of seizure-free life together. We don't know how long the break will last, maybe a short time or maybe the rest of our lives, but we're grateful for it every day. I know that God worked through all these people to bring us this chance to spend this time together as a family, and He was able to do that because they had the obstacle-removing tool of compassion. I'd like to go a little deeper now on the role of compassion. There are physical obstacles to overcome in life, like the story I just shared. But there are also spiritual and emotional obstacles to overcome in life. There are feelings and blind spots that are like mountains blocking the paths that allow the Lord to arrive and work through us. In Luke 3, John the Baptist is preaching around Jordan about baptism and the remission of sins. He quotes Isaiah and says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. That's us. We are one but we can't see it because we are lost in this experience of separation. He says, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Notice he makes no promise that God will remove our obstacles for us. He says the responsibility is on us to clear the paths for the Lord to come through. He then says, Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight. And the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all the flesh shall see the salvation of God. He used the Isaiah passage here to exhort the people to prepare the way for Christ by removing the obstacles to transformation, as though they are leveling mountains. And it sure feels as difficult as leveling a mountain sometimes. It can even feel impossible if those mountains feel justified. But if we do the inner work to remove those obstacles, we clear the way, and he promises that the flesh will see the salvation of God. What does it mean that the flesh will see the salvation of God? The flesh is us, as physical humans. Salvation is the preservation or deliverance from destruction. It means we, in our physical bodies, will see the preservation of God in our open hearts. Nephi said that Isaiah's words would be plain to those of us in the latter days. We are the generations that are evolved enough to have the ears to hear and the eyes to see. Since Isaiah's words are mentioned multiple times from multiple sources, they must be essential to hear and comprehend. When we do the inner work to prepare the paths of the Lord, we prepare the way for Him to arrive in and through us. We remove the obstacles that keep us from becoming the vessels of His Spirit. Prophet after prophet have instructed us to prepare the way for the second coming. The second coming cannot come except through our individual and collective preparation. Compassion is a major tool to removing the obstacles and leveling the mountains. I had a recent experience where I was filled with anger and judgment towards someone for expressing their anger and judgment publicly. How hypocritical I felt condemning someone for condemning. I knew it was wrong and that it was blocking me from feeling God's love. I knew it because it felt bad. It was the opposite of love and compassion. Our feelings are amazing. They are a gift. They communicate to us. They are to be listened to, not avoided or ignored. If they block the spirit, they are not to be justified in self-righteousness. Whenever we find ourselves feeling angry and judgmental, we can take that as a sign, a gift, an invitation to bring out the divine tool of compassion and remove those mountains that block the spirit from dwelling within us. Anger and judgment are there to tell us that we lack understanding for another, or even for ourselves. There are lots of struggles that are invisible to an outside perspective. Sometimes our own struggles are even invisible to ourselves. We can take the invitation of anger, judgment, and separation to look inside our own hearts. Seek to understand. Seek to understand so deeply that we find compassion, that we find unity, that we suffer with those who suffer, we weep with those who weep, and we celebrate with those who celebrate. After all, united as one, we make up the body of Christ. 
It's up to us to make the paths leveled and straight for his return. I'm grateful that God allowed me to hear the rest of this talk. I hope it's helpful to you, too. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, um, uh, I would like to leave this in a prayer, uh, a benediction prayer to say, to say our closing prayer, and I will do that. Let us pray. Loving Creator God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your presence with us. We thank you that we can come to sacrament to re reaffirm our covenant to you. We thank you for your love. We ask for peace in our world. We ask that people will take on compassion and get to know each other instead of segregation and, and other things. We pray that we can come together one day with your help. So we thank you, Lord, and ask you to bless us this week. And we say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Shalom, brothers and sisters. Shalom, brothers. Peace be with you.